Hi, my name is Sophie McDonald. Um, I'm a researcher at the Scottish University's Environmental Research Centre, um, so based at the University of Glasgow. Um, so, yeah, so I'm presenting on the project I'm a postdoc on at the moment, which is the Leverhulme Trust funded Beyond Walls project. So, we're looking at new narratives for settlement and land use in this Roman, um, Roman Empire frontier zone in Northern Britain. So the team is made up of, oh, I just need to get my slideshow to move on there. Sorry. So, um, so yeah, so there's, there's me obviously based at Swark um, and then Derek Hamilton, who's also based at Swark at the University of Glasgow. We've got Manuel fernandez Guts based at the University of Edinburgh, who's our PI. And then the other postdoc on the project is Ian Hardwick, who's also at Edinburgh and Dave Kiley, from HES, so that's uh, the dream team for Beyond Walls. And the project itself then is look at these landscape and settlement dynamics in basically a project area that spans between Hadrian's Wall and the Anstein Wall with this roughly 40 kilometer buffer zone either way. So in practice, you're looking at basically an area from about Durham to about Creef. Um, just to really capture that activity, not just within the walls, but in that kind of slight zone beyond them as well. We look at the millennium between about 500 BC to about 500 AD, and really look at variation in land use and settlement across time and space within this project area. In terms of our main research questions, uh, look at these settlement trajectories. Is there any influence that we can pull out um, of a Roman presence? And this is where this, this buffer zone really comes in as well. So in areas where there's perhaps more evidence of a Roman presence, are we seeing a different settlement trajectory in terms of indigenous settlement sites or not? Um, appearance and disappearance of different site types. So you've got um, examples like lowland broths. Um, variation across time and space, which I've touched on just there, but yeah, just in general, the broad patterns um, that we're seeing within our study area. And also, I'm seeing change in terms of um, economic strategies, so what's happening in the wider landscape as well. And these are outlined in more detail in an antiquity paper that was published last year. Um, so I'd strongly recommend you go and check that out if you want to uh, read in any more depth about those. Obviously, there are challenges uh, within this. We're working on both sides of the of the border between England and Scotland. So you've obviously got differences in how data um, about the archaeological record is um, is collated and is, is made available to the public. And then you've also got obviously issues about academic divides within Roman and prehistoric archaeology. Um, you know, in terms of coming at it from from a kind of Iron Age perspective. Um, and then coming at it from a kind of Romanist perspective. And I think within the project team, we've got um, pretty good representation of both of those perspectives there. And yeah, so the survey data has never been pulled together before like this in terms of a, a kind of super regional analysis. Uh, we're dealing with data from very disparate sources, which um, I'll outline just slightly later in the talk. But basically this kind of pulling it all together um, hasn't been done at, uh, at this scale. And then also there are issues around the chronological resolution of the record. So as we'll go on to discuss, um, we're dealing with kind of survey data, we're dealing with excavation data, dealing with environmental data as well. And basically in terms of um, sites that we're maybe looking at, um, that we're maybe looking at from our survey perspective, a lot of those maybe haven't been excavated, they're just being dated based on kind of, kind of morphological features, some of our historic excavations, um, there might be dates only from artefacts, or you may be also dealing with legacy radiocarbon dates that um, are, aren't necessarily particularly precise. Um, and it's also issues around what has been dated and what activity those dates represent. So lots of challenges there, uh, lots of you getting on with. In terms of tackling that then, um, we've got these five separate strands really to the project that we're pulling together. So the first of these is our aerial and field survey research. So this is looking at things like uh, like LIDAR data, um, basically a, a, a visual evidence um, for, for our settlement sites. 
And then we've got our archival strand, which is really um, looking through looking through our, our databases, looking through our, our data sources, and basically identifying information about sites, recording information about sites, and then feeding into the radiocarbon dating strand, um, identifying sites that might be of interest for new dates. So basically new dates from archival samples. And then we've also got a paleoenvironmental research strand there. So this is basically um, paleoenvironmental analysis of selected cores um, from within our case study areas, which I'll just flick back to there. So um, yeah, we've got these four separate case study areas where we're gonna be looking at data in more depth. So you've got um, basically three, which is the one that we've done the most work on so far, kind of sits within this kind of recent Galloway, Solway Firth area. Then you've got two slightly over um, further east in the borders, study one area really encompasses like Deer Street um, and then our four case study area four is our Antonine Wall case study area really. So yeah and then you've got your synthesis so really pulling all this data together and looking at this in uh, in in the light of kind of theory as well when we start to pull out our pull out our stories from this data. So in terms of the aerial and field survey research then, yeah, so we're basically collating our survey data from national and regional historic environment records and basically just putting this data within a common framework, which is something, um, as I stated earlier, that hasn't really been done before. Then also using our LIDAR data, our aerial photographs, to explore any gaps in the existing evidence and also to look for new sites as well. Um, there's also some geophysical survey going on within for case study areas um, just to offer basically working um, to offer slightly like more in-depth enhanced understanding of the settlement record within those case study areas. In terms of the archival research then, um, this is the part where we're doing our, our desk-based assessment. So we're looking at excavated settlement data from nationally and locally held records. So that ties into this field survey research. So um, basically, I'll go on to talk a little bit more about it later, but basically Ian, the other postdoc on the project is pulling together a really fantastic database that includes information where you can see if a site has been excavated. So basically I'll work from the site being excavated and then look through basically um, the literature around that to um, use to assess the physical and paper archives for selected sites within our case study areas. So then using that um, assessment of these archives to select artifacts and ecofacts will be worth um, basically dating in our um, radiocarbon dating strand of the project. Yeah, the paleo environmental strand then looking at this environmental impact or otherwise of the Roman presence. Um, so we've basically collated all the existing information for the um, for the region, and basically we're now looking at creating some new data sets based on cores um, from basically selected sites within our case study area. And yeah, and the radiocarbon dating ties into all these other strands because basically we're going through these archives to pull out any sites and contacts that we're interested in getting and then using that in combination with the legacy dates to create um, new modelled chronologies basically for settlement within our case study area. And then just pulling this all together, so placing it within a wider, wider context, looking at these kind of broader patterns of continuity and change and also placing this within a theoretical context about kind of what goes on on the edges of empires. So this is Ian's strand. Um, so I'm going to try and do it justice, um, but this is really more what he's been dealing with. So basically Ian's looking for evidence for settlement patterns, um, this more kind of uh, survey data, um, space assessment level. So he's working from the kind of broad brush entire region 
down to a case study level. So for the entire region, basically in collection, all the existing data that we've got relating to our, our, our study periods, so our kind of 500 BC to AD 500 um, timeframe, and using this to look at these broad patterns across the region over time, um, and feeding all this information into GIS and running analyses through GIS to understand these, these patterns better. And then within our case study areas, he's basically bringing uh, information from those disparate sources into a really consistent format in his database. And then we're using this kind of more in-depth information to look for gaps. So we're, we're using it, looking at the kind of LIDAR data and basically trying to get the level where we've got enough information about the chronology of and the different forms of settlement within our case study areas that we can start to look at kind of variation and we can start to look at different patterns of what's going on. So this is um, this is kind of what the database is shaping up to look like. Um, so you can see here that we've assigned basically every site gets its own project ID and the various types of information that are recorded about them. So you've got um, information about morphology, um, broad period that it, um, it's thought to date to, and then also we've got information about whether it's you know, got an artifact date or whether it's got a scientific date already associated with it. So a lot of this is building on work that was done as a pilot study with the British Academy um, in 2021. Um, so this was using high resolution LIDAR data to look at um, indigenous activity in this area around Burnswork Hillfort. So in Southwest Scotland, so this was an area of about a thousand, um, sorry, 1.5 kilometres squared. And within that, they identified um, it was 704 late Iron Age sites. And within that, there was 134 new sites that were um, were discovered through assessment of this data and you can see in this next slide here so over this is over a, a range castle um so yeah you can see that basically we've got our, our known site there um which is a and then you've got b which was pulled out from the lidar data in 2021 so you've got these two enclosures here so there's also been some geophysical work that's gone on in that area uh, through the German Archaeological Institute, and that's been looking at the uh, the sequence of Roman camps at Middleby um, associated with Brunswick Hill for it there. <clears throat> in terms of our case study three, then, and this is the area that we're probably furthest along with. So this is our block down in Friesen Galloway. Um, so it's a 20 kilometre by 75 kilometre block and basically encompasses, it's mostly in uh, in Dumfries there, uh, but it does slightly edge over the border into Cumbria and encompasses a little bit of southern Lanarkshire. So when we were talking earlier about pulling together this data from various disparate sources, this is, this is the type of stuff we're talking about. So you're working with obviously Canmore and um, the English NRHG, which you access through Heritage Gateway. But then we've also got projects that have gone on like the Hillforts Atlas. You've got the English Landscapes Project and the Roman Rural Settlement Project, which are all also um, feeding in to, uh, to our project there when we're pulling together that data. And so far within that study area, um, we've identified 720 indigenous settlements, um, only 41 of which have, have a date or a scientific date associated, and um, 216 Roman sites within that. Um, and then obviously you've got this massive network of Roman roads as well, and obviously Hadrian's Wall. In terms of case study two, so this is this area slightly further over to the east. Uh, we've got about half of that done so far. Um, and within that, we've got 30 new indigenous settlement sites, um, one new Roman site. And in terms of pulling out preliminary findings regarding, uh, you know, variation, facial variation in the settlement record, you've got probably a greater range of settlement types visible um, as surviving earthworks than over in block three. And within that, you're able to see um, morphological, the morphology of those settlements better. Um, so it's whether that's to just to do with how those landscapes um, have been used through time and just, yeah, basically differences in 
um, trajectories over time in those areas is something that we'll pull out in our analysis. In terms of dates from settlements, so we've identified and retrieved um, samples for dating from sites within our, our case study three area. Um, and we're currently working through records from other areas to identify further sites and uh, samples suitable for dating. But you can see there, I've just put all the dates from Iron Bridge. So the ones with the num BU numbers on that kind of um, one on the right hand side, they're the legacy dates. And then anything with a SWERC um, number is a new date. But you can see that they're roughly in line. Um, with what was expected for that site. So, so Karen Bridge is a site where you've basically got two Iron Age enclosures and a Roman temporary camp. Um, so we thought that'd be an interesting one to kind of untangle the sequence of, um, of settlement and of, of Iron Age use of that site. So we've, we were broadly in line with the legacy dates there, but it'd be interesting to pull out those dates where they do have a, kind of an earlier an earlier set of dates, so it'd be interesting to pull out why. Um, so in terms of the legacy data for the paleo environment, then we've got over 100 legacy pollen sites within our case study broad area. Um, I think it's 119, 120. Uh, we're at now because obviously new ones keep popping up. Um, and there are issues of chronological resolution there that really do limit the questions that we can ask and answer with that data. So a lot of the time you're working with um, data sets where they're not necessarily brilliantly dated. Um, so out of these 119 total records, only 91 have any dates from the cores. Only 38 have more than five dates and um, only nine of those cores have more than 10 dates. And some of those cores are getting on for 10 meters in depth. So you're not looking at a brilliant chronological resolution for that paleo environmental record. A lot of those um, interpretations that have been pulled out of that paleo environmental data are based on these um, simply interpolated age depth models um, based on very few dates in some instances. So that really does start to limit how precise you can be um, in your interpretations of that data. There's like good coverage spatially, um, as I noted, and you can see in this slide here that you know it, it's pretty reasonably well distributed. It's obviously clustered around where the peak actually is within our study area. Um, a lot of work was done in the 1970s and also in the 1990s there was a kind of floret of um, the environmental work done in the area. So a lot of stuff was done by Judith Fire in the 70s and then a lot of the 1990s work is, uh, is Keith Barber, Lisa Domain PT. And most of those um, analyses are really asking questions about, about the Roman presence, about any potential Roman impact. So within that, um, there are some outstanding questions at some sites um, I'm interested in pulling out. And basically, in terms of strategy for paleo environmental analysis, looking at revisiting sites that have outstanding questions that I'm interested in, and also um, if, if there are any that have particularly low chronological resolution. Um, so, yeah, so we're revisiting some legacy paleo environmental sites and then also um, some new sites that we're basically choosing to explore any spatial variation um, in land use over time. So far, we've got cores from four sites. Um, so we're trying to keep those within case study areas, like the kind of narrow case study areas rather than the broad survey areas. Uh, uh, the broad study area as much as we can, um, although obviously it does depend on whether there is a, a suitable site for that. So first of those is Burnfoot Hill Moss, so that's down um, right next to the um, Scotland-England border on the Solway Firth, and that was, um, that was analysed by Richard Tipping um, in the 90s. Um, it was it was okay in terms of dates, um, and it was but it was hard to distinguish in terms of the existing uh, chronology for the court whether any clearance that was observed in the area was late Iron Age or whether it was associated with more of a Romano British presence. So thought we'd revisit that site to maybe pull out that question. Um, Moat now, which is in this kind of area that's really rich in archaeology, um, it's quite a busy landscape around there in um, our case study two area. 
and that only had one day. It's it, it's quite a short court. It was only one meter, um, but basically you, you're surrounded by enclosures and settlement evidence. And if you go down there, you, you can just really see the landscape. It's just very busy. Um, so yeah, we've also got Locker Bam, which is our new site. So this was chosen basically to reflect um, it basically to reflect a kind of regional signal um, for that area down in case study three. Um, it's quite close to a lot of settlement sites from our period. And then Fineside Muir, which is up around the back of Cumbernauld, really. Um, so that was included in a lot of um, lucid domain PTs analyses in the 1990s, and it's really close to the Einstein wall. So hopefully it'll give us a good signal um, for activity that's going on around that frontier. So yeah, this is just a kind of some of our new dates that we've got back from the course. So it's a bit of a shame, you can see with the Moat Now one, actually we're only really catching the end of our study period. So it might be worth us looking elsewhere in that case study two area see if we can um to see if we can get a core that really catches more of the period that we're interested in but for our Burnfoot Hill Moss um it's great we, we've managed to catch the whole period there so that's fantastic we're basically carrying on with what we're doing um continuing to identify and date uh, assessment sites paleo environment sites um obviously we need to get a bit of a, a shift on with some of it I think in terms of time and then also pulling out these patterns and trends that we've got in the data. Please feel free to contact me um, at sophiemadonnas at glasgow.ac.uk. If you'd like any more in-depth information, I'll be around for questions at the end of this.